Welcome back to the Kaiser Report Winter Why Not special. Time now to turn to Deborah Solomon, founder and artistic director of, it's actually an unpronounceable Dutch company. Uh, and we're going to ask her about that. Uh, how do you pronounce this company's name? Urbania Hoover. That's not too bad. Urbania yeah. Hoover. What's okay. the English translation of that? The city as our farmyard. The entire city is our farmyard. Okay, so when I described to my two British girlfriends last night that I was speaking to somebody about an edible city, they were like, oh, so like buildings would be cakes? So, <laughs> gingerbread. So, <laughs> will we have gingerbread houses and, and cake buildings, or is it something actually more nutritious than cake? Yeah, much more nutritious. It's about uh, taking all of the surfaces and seeing how they can, t uh, first of all, be greened, and adding um, a biomass layer that's edible. So think of fruit trees that are espaliered flat alongside buildings. Think about um, pavement that's sem like semi-open and that it has uh, plants that are good for an ecosystem that supports in other parts of this landscape uh, edible. Plants. A lot of buildings right now on the yeah. the, the roofs. The, they have yes. uh, they're going green. So uh, it's another space you could you could grow stuff, stuff to eat. But um, now, mostly uh, edible rooftops, they have a certain layer of biomass, but it could be in relationship to the volume of the built environment. So one could say, we want to grow this much biomass for this much built mass, and that would be possible. So it goes into the architectural scheme of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're making that equation. So when you're adding a, la a layer of biomass, in other words, right now you have green spaces, trees mm -hmm. and whatnot, but I guess it's, you need a different kind of layer of, of biomass, as you're, as you're talking yeah, about it, to grow more, more fruity trees and things. Yeah, more, uh, yeah, multi-layered. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't necessarily mean um, a very deep earth layer that you're putting on. There are forests, park-like forests, uh, with uh, mature trees growing on 35 centimeters. I know of a few examples in the Netherlands with anchored trees obviously okay so what does this do in other words so i guess right away you you don't you're not shipping food in and out of the city so you're saving yes. a lot on ecology in that way yes the cost i guess because you're not shipping you know there's a lot of benefits right so what are the benefits of this well one of the benefits one of the main benefits is climactic it has to do with how all of the city is going to perform. So this greenery is also a lung. It's an air filter. Yeah, there's, there's that greenhouse effect in a city, right? Yes. The cities are always hotter, so already you have a sort of greenhouse in which to grow them. Yes, so when you think of cities, uh, you can think of growing nutritious things like fruit and veg and herbs. And um, you can think of putting, uh, of growing also a very good soil organism, which together with this plant layer is also a lung. It also absorbs more water, so you have less flooding. So what about the actual edible part of this, um, this city, of this urban landscape? The, the, what do they call it? What do you call it? The forest garden. Forest garden. What about that aspect of it? I know it, outside of Seattle, about two miles outside of downtown Seattle, they have the the beacon food forest. Yes. They actually call it a food forest. Yes. So who gets to eat it? Is it anybody that's happened to walk and buy? Can you just pick an apple and eat it? Is it, is it the communities? Well, what Urbania Hoover means is that, yes, anyone could. It's, we have a, a, a campaign called Free Food for All because uh, we believe that the nutritious food should actually be free for the picking. Right now we have what are called food deserts in right. places like East London and the poor areas where they don't have access to a lot of fruits yeah. or vegetables because those are, um, it's just junk food shops essentially right. out there. So it would, you, I guess, in those sort of areas would be the first prime example of where to build this right. food forest? Absolutely. And it's a, a group of people that don't buy fresh uh, veg and fruit right now. So it's not really taking away work from farmers. It would uh, create more demand for local, organic, of course, uh, fruit and veg later. How come the, uh, you know, in some cities in Los Angeles, I think, there was uh, an urban garden in Watts or, you know, yeah. in, in, and, and then uh, Daryl Hannah was sitting in a tree for a while yes. because they wanted to close this garden down. So what's the p politics there? Why, why is there a pushback? Because uh, land values are very high and they earn more money from real estate or just about anything else than food growing. The irony is that the thing that saves us, the thing that we need every single day, like fresh veg and fresh fruit, to live in beautiful green spaces for our well-being, that that has 
absolutely no economic value. So in, in terms of economic value to this sort of thing, in Manhattan, for example, you have the thing called the High Line, which right. was an abandoned, raised uh, rail track mm -hmm. that used to bring meat in from the Hudson down to yeah. the Meatpacking District. So they, they spent... I think it was like over a couple hundred million dollars to to build this up into a like a beautiful, beautiful forest area, area. Um, not edible, but it's a forest area. And not only has there been no graffiti, we've been going it for mm -hmm. years now, but all of the property values around there have skyrocketed, and it's brought in so many entrepreneurs, so many new restaurants, mm -hmm. so many sort of new uh, creative people that now, even though everybody resisted it at first because they didn't want to pay the taxes to build it, they now there's a plan afoot to turn uh, Broadway all the way from Union Square up to Columbus Circle, which is like you know, 70 blocks, mm -hmm. so, to turn all of that into a garden, Broadway. Yes. So uh, everybody, it's actually, they've seen the economic value to it, and now right. they want more. The High Line is uh, magnificent. It's not edible. Yeah. It's mostly, uh, it's very ornamental. It's designed by a fantastic uh, landscape architect and, uh, and nurseryman, uh, Pete oh. Adolf. Oh, you know. But, yeah. yes. <laughs> but uh, it, it serves as an example. It makes people enthusiastic, but it can be much, much more. Obviously, the amount of uh, biomass in such a, a, a planting, it's Again, it's inspiring and it gets people's imagination going, but it's not uh, the kind of landscaping that's going to feed you. But it could be. Now, we had on our show just a few months ago, Bez, who was uh, with a group called Happy Mondays. Mm -hmm. And he's got something called the Edible Landscape, I think he calls it. That's similar to yes. this. Yeah. So this is similar, right? I mean, yeah. his idea is you need to turn the... In, in, in. But let's talk about the economics for a second, because... Mm -hmm. You know, the externalities are what are not being right. accounted for. So in the area, let's say, of fracking, they don't account for the costs. Yep. So they have a very misguided notion about the, how that economically works. Here, there's no cost to the benefits. You're saying that there's more money to be made in development. Yeah, unless you consider the money you're saving on transportation, ecological cleanup, health issues, That's and all this it. other, the externalities. If you, if you, so in your role... Um, do you have to bring in some kind of comprehensive economic analysis? Do, do you rely on outsiders for that? Do you do, you do that? How does that? What do you? Well, no that? one has ever asked us to provide those kinds of numbers. There are numbers. To, I mean, that we can. There are references that we can uh, reference. But um, these externalities, for example, the benefits. You can't really talk about ecosystem services. That's what these benefits are called, unless they offset. Uh, uh, a problem. So, for example, there was flooding in uh, Cumbria, England. Yeah. 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 So you could talk about the amount of damage that that, ca that, that yeah. caused, that wet, that bad weather caused, and uh, and how that could have been offset by deep planting, multi-layer, sure. a different kind of soil that absorbed more water. Um, so the government could, itself mm -hmm. had spent 14 million pounds prior to these floods on flood defenses, but those were concrete and you yeah. know, metal. So this is, um, well, we saw that also in the Boxing Day tsunami a few years ago. All the mangroves had been pulled out for development of uh, tourist hotels. Yes. So they got hit hard. Um, yeah, I mean, look at a, a situ uh, in, in China, for example, people were shocked that a local restaurant, when they got their bill, there was a surcharge for having breathed fresh air in the restaurant, <laughs> that there was polluted so much outside. Right. So these, again, externalities yeah. are not being accounted for. But Absolutely um, not. in downtown Seattle, there's the Beacon Food Forest. Yes. So do you know about this? Is this an example of what you're talking about? Well, uh, yeah, it's absolutely an example. And it's uh, the first time that there's such a large spatial planning uh, project being done. And now also in the UK, one of the things that we've had is not only the collapse of the bee population. And actually, what I read is that um, the 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 bee population is thriving in cities because yes. of city beehives. Now, also in the UK, just in the past month or so, they've announced that um, the butterfly population has also collapsed. 76% of them have um, suffered declines in population. Some are up. But primarily, it's due to, they said, intensive agriculture. Yes. 
and um, they also said it's changing woodland management. So would this be a, a way to save some of the, yes. the, the ne necessary to our agriculture? We don't understand that, but bees and butterflies do all the pollination for us. Yeah, this is absolutely a way to uh, produce an, eco, uh, an ecosystem that's really robust. Mm. And uh, even an edible landscape, not every single thing has to be edible. It's about the landscape. It's about the soil uh, organism, and it's about diversity. Diversity. So um, at the moment, cities are more diverse places for nature, for uh, yeah. plant and insect life, than a lot of agricultural space because of... In the countryside, yeah. Absolutely. It's weird, yeah. Yeah, thankfully. <laughs> so uh, tell us about in tropical workshops. Okay, well, Intropical is an exhibition going on right now in the Amstel Park in the Netherlands. It's part of a curatorial program called Zone to Source. It's about uh, technology and nature and where they meet in the context of art. And what? Say that yeah. Again. Technology, Bitcoin. technology <laughs> and nature meet within the context of art. Yes, because, okay. well, we just spoke about it a little bit. Like, the value of nature is much lower than the value of uh, fina certain financial markets. So in this project, we try to bring those two in close contact with each other so that there's this uh, tension. So, for example, you asked about the Bitcoin. We have, um, in this exhibition, we have a Bitcoin miner mining away. And what happens when a computer heat. mines? It produces lots of heat. Yeah. And so this heat is producing, is warming the space up for some incubators, which are also mining, but they're, being, they're mined by mycelium, by fungi. And this fungi is producing these um, sort of m these mats made out of cardboard, another waste material. And these uh, mats will be used to regenerate urban soils in the Netherlands. So we use the waste product of the Bitcoin mining to help the other miners, the fungi, as they mine nutrients also ah, later in the soil, yeah. and uh, um, eating an urban waste material cardboard. And so the... So you get to uh, a point of zero waste, correct? I mean, there's yeah. a goal. I mean, I think some some cities have achieved that. I'm, I'm trying to, I think in Germany, perhaps, there's one where they've been able to, eh, we're almost out of time. <laughs> we have to go. We have to go. Anyway. <laughs> but I, I wore my edible shirt, by yes. the way, for this. It's, it's like all <laughs> the forest. On the yeah, the, blue, the blueberry <laughs> section is particularly delightful. I can tell you that right now. Well, that's going to do it for this uh, Kaiser Report. Winter, why not? segment on edible urban landscapes with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Deborah Solomon. She's the founder and artistic director of Urbania Hoover. <laughs> Urbania Hoover. If you'd like to send us your thoughts on this episode, why not tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.